Hello all, um, welcome, and in this lecture we're going to look at supply chain contracts. Uh, supply chain contracts, um, you know, walking through some of the key points in advance here, we have a growth of outsourcing, and outsourcing, you know, this non-core work, um, it allows us as a firm to focus on our core competence. We'll do a make versus buy and make sense, we, you know, understand what makes sense to move externally, what we want to keep internally, and even sometimes we may want to bring something back in to move something out. Um, we're finding low-cost suppliers domestically and internationally that can do the work that we need at uh, a quality level that we can accept. Um, the extent of outsourcing across the firm's value train, chain can be extensive. Um, you know, what are some of the enablers of outsourcing? Um, so really, the, the digital age and the globalization of the economy has really been an enabler of outsourcing. If you think about 20, 30, 40 years ago, you couldn't contact people in uh, you know, halfway around the world to make business happen. Now, um, I can send emails to suppliers in Korea or Taiwan, and tomorrow I have a response. Um and there is falling cost and rising reliability of transportation. Sea freight is, is, uh, has really been streamlined, and, and it's just so cheap to ship stuff ocean-wise. And even air freight is, is, as long as oil is stable, air freight is not inexpensive. There have been revolutionary advances that really have made outsourcing much more beneficial and possible. And procurement is getting such a higher role. Um, they're, they're viewed as more strategic and more critical to the business. We're negotiating contracts, terms, and conditions. We're conducting supplier relationship management, and we're protecting the firm. We're really being stewards of the company's resources, resources um, financial resources, intellectual property resources, trade secrets. Um, and, and by doing this, we're really allowed to strategically leverage ourselves and our skill sets to really bring benefit to the organization. So some common elements of supply contracts, um, we're looking at price. What is our price at, at certain volumes? Are we getting discounts at certain volumes? If we hit you know, annual volumes of, of uh, expenditure of the supplier, are we getting incentives? Are we getting rebates? We also look at the order quantities. Oftentimes the suppliers will want you to agree to a minimum order quantity. We want that number to be as low as possible. They want it to be as high as possible. We'll also look at order multiples. Um, they may say you have to buy uh, 500 as a minimum and they have to be in increments of 10. So we cannot order 501. We have to order 510. Um, and then maximum contract quantities. So this may be in some industries, maybe the microchip industry, uh, maybe um components that are somewhat rare, somewhat uh, constrained, they may try to regulate who is getting what. Um, delivery times will also be considerations in your contracts. Um, it, they'll specify uh, initial shipment is X, following shipments are X. Um, your lead time for a volume change may be even specified. It could be something to where um, if you want an order variance outside of a 20% spike, you have a increased lead time by three weeks to accommodate. Um, in these contracts, you'll want to put in your product and material quality, um, oftentimes referring to external documents for quality control. Um, procurement people, we like to think we're smart, but please pull in quality when you do this. We'll have terms, payment due dates. Uh, are we paying them net 30, net 60? Um, I know someone that once got a supplier to agree to net 120. I like to think I'm good at negotiating, but I probably don't know if I could pull that off. Are we getting a discount for paying them on time, for paying them early? Um, that guy that got net 120 did not get a discount on top of the net 120, but can't get everything, I guess. Um, we're going to talk about return policies, reverse logistics, service parts. Um, if it goes out of uh, serial production, can we still get spare parts? So we're going to have some areas of risk. The seller is going to have some risk that the goods that are sold could be returned. They could have less revenue. They could have inefficient production, too high demand, uncertainty, and, and maybe they can't fulfill the orders. 
The buyer run the risk of having too much inventory. Are we writing down our inventory? Are we having to buy at too high MOQs? Um, are the supplier not able to meet and we have lost sales? Therefore, the buyer tries to limit the order quantity and they try to match the inventory to the demand. And the underlying assumptions that we will face is that, you know, the buyer must assume all the risk of matching demand and supply. The seller must sell in lumpy increments, you know, to really maximize production. And both have a role to play in meeting demand. So, you know, some key contracts that you may see is contracts for your strategic components. These are going to be a little more IP protection heavy. Uh, contracts for make to stock, make to order. You know, these are going to really focus on pricing and lead time. Um, an assurance of supply, contracts for um, non-strategic components. Those are more if you just have a high-level relationship with a supplier that you want to manage. Um, you know, when you look at the strategic components, we're going to have arm's length relationship with these suppliers. The supplier wants to sell you as much as they can, as quickly as they can. They want to make as much money. That's what they're in business for. Um, they want to hold the least amount of inventory possible. And the customer wants to buy the least amount possible. They want to avoid stockouts. They want to hold the least amount of inventory. When we're looking at... Um, Contracts for strategic components, we have a buyback contract. The seller buys back unsold goods from the buyer. Um, they can cap the returnable quantity. The buyer has an incentive to order more from the supplier to avoid their stockouts, and the seller assumes more risk of goods sold being returned. Um, you can have some flexibility where the seller buys back unsold goods from the buyer for a full refund. You can have where the buyer has the incentive to order more from the seller. Um, so really, the the thing is, with a contract, you can do as, as much as you want to make this work. Um, you can do revenue sharing, where the seller, seller discounts the unit price to the buyer, um, or the buyer shares revenue with the seller, um, or where you split cost savings that you generate together. Um, it's difficult to monitor unit sales and revenue, so uh, you really need to make sure you're doing this properly. And if, if you're selling back, buying back goods, um, that does become less risky. Um, you have a sales rebate where the seller provides the buyer with a rebate if a certain volume is hit. So if, let's say, five years in a row, I am a uh, Kohler and I'm selling to Home Depot and... Home Depot spends $10 million with me every year, and they come and they say, I want a discount, I want a discount. And I say, I tell you what, I cannot give you a discount, but if you buy $15 million from me, I will give you a retroactive 10% discount. Um, that's very, very common when you look at supply contracts. Um, so when you, when you start working on contracts, it's really important that you are, you know, sharing credible information with each other, that you are being transparent with each other because you're going to have moments in a contract negotiation that are tense, that seem adversarial. But at the end of that contract negotiation, at the end of that relationship, you do have to work with that, with that supplier again. Um, there's going to be some challenges. You want to understand the length of the contract. Maybe you need a one-term, a one-year term. Maybe you need a two-year term. You want to have flexible options to extend it at the end. You want to have clear language of how you terminate it. Um, you want to have clear language of how you buy, how it affects your portfolio, your spend portfolio if you're the buyer, how it affects your sales portfolio if you're the customer or the seller. Um, and, you know, really... You want to find the right mix. It, the, the contract is no more, no less a negotiation than the price. Um, so really, really high-level discussion on contracts. I negotiate them for a living, so if anyone wants to chat further, please reach out to me.